Welcome to Living a Sex Positive Life, where we can guarantee the topic will be about sex. We'll talk about the good and the bad, the health and healing benefits, the adventures, the relationships, as well as the crimes and the tragedies. Our mission is to educate, entertain, and just talk about that touchy subject that affects us all, sex. Now here's your host, Angelique Luna. Good evening, everyone. It's Angelique Luna, and I'm here with my hubby and co-host, John C. Luna. Hello, everyone. And tonight, we have a special guest from all across the world, Dr. Martha Tara Lee. Based in Singapore, Dr. Martha Tara Lee is the founder and clinical sexologist of Eros Coaching. She is a certified sexuality educator with ASEC and holds a doctorate in human sexuality. She provides sexuality and intimate coaching for individuals and couples, conducts sexual education workshops, and speaks at public events. Welcome to the show, Martha. How are you? Good. Thank you for having me. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, I was looking at your video that you posted yesterday in regards to Arrow's coaching and looking at the amount of education you have. You Did you travel the whole world to get that? Because you were like UK, <laughs> Australia, United States. I was like, wow, this girl has miles. Yeah, I am. Um... I made sure that I get I got as much education that I had um, to get the necessary credentials in Singapore. Uh, you know, credentials are really important, and I didn't want people questioning and feeling unsafe coming to see me. So yeah, I went and got all this training. How is sex education different in Singapore versus your travels? Um, while growing up, I had no sex education. There was no sex education whatsoever for my generation. And um, if people were lucky, they got into the science stream and that's where they learned biology. And of course, they didn't really cover much about the female anatomy. I remember every year when I was in secondary school, which is high school, uh, in the U.S., there would be people coming through and giving talks about the menstrua menstrual cycle, and actually they were from like you know sanitary companies, and uh, that was like once a year kind of a torture. That was really only just for the women or girls uh, or young ladies, and uh, the boys got to play, and so that that really felt like a punishment. And I remember one year there was this uh, anti-abortion uh, talk where they gave out little uh, footprint uh, collar pins and uh, it was pretty horrifying really watching how an abortion happens in video and then given, given this pin and told this is what will happen if you get pregnant. And um, many years later as a sex educator, uh, now, uh, met someone who actually attended the same talk as I did, and uh, this really affected her sex life. For the rest of her life after that talk, she was just terrified to get pregnant, <laughs> and um, even after she's uh, menopausal, she's, she's just like really uh, scared of sex. So those were the, the, the messages that we got growing up. And uh, now in Singapore, we do have some kind of sex education. However, it's more of an abstinence-based uh, program. Um, this has to do with the AWARE saga about eight years ago. We call it the AWARE saga. Uh, AWARE is a um, gender equality advocacy group in Singapore and uh, they started a sex ed program around the time I was training to be a sex educator and they were overtaken by this religious Christian group who thought that they were basically doing the devil's work oh, wow. and yeah and there was this um, 
basically they took over the membership they got rid of the supposed old guards and then uh, they were criticizing AWARE's uh, sex ed programs that was being run in schools. So AWARE managed to get back the organization. But my point in sharing this uh, story is that since that episode, um, the Ministry of Education here is very scared of um, running sex ed programs. So they decided to do the safe route because the Christian parents can be very vocal and influential. And so they um, decided to have a more conservative approach of, of an abstinence-based program, which really doesn't um, do much to help the younger generation. So I deal with the fallout every day, right, in my work. Uh, lots of people, my generation, they are in their late thirties now, and um, and also people probably the generation before, like my my brother is ten years younger, like my brother's generation. Um, they they didn't have um, sex ed in school, uh, so in dealing with the fallout, I'm dealing with people who don't know much about sex, and um, may not even be able to have sex. Yeah, so let's just leave that at that, that for now. Wow, you are a sex educator superhero over there. My gosh. I mean, it sounds similar to like our Bible Belt here in the South when it comes to Christians and pushing their influence on abstinence-based only uh, education because that's very rampant over here in the South. Well, Texas is notorious for that. Sorry, Texas. Um in regards to the lack of sex education, but I feel really bad for that one woman who was traumatized over an abortion film. I'm like, whoa, that's that's major, major horror stories. Because yeah. we were we were still young, you know, and that's why we were very uh, impressionable as well. And really, what's happening right now uh, is even though Singapore is multicultural. And we have people of all walks of life and all kinds of nationalities, a little bit like New York, uh, except we are more Asian. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have like all kinds of nationalities here. Uh, so it's really this big melting pot of people. So I'm very fortunate, even though, uh, you know, it's quite like sexually quite repressed, but because we are so economic, and economically driven. Uh, so there's a lot of this influence of Western culture here, yet the people are still not very open uh, when it comes to sex. So we can be open in a lot of a, a lot of things, a lot of areas, but when it comes to sex, uh, suddenly there's this war. And my uh, American and uh, European friends um, they are really quite surprised that uh, for the amount of uh, education that people have uh, who are, uh, in, in Singapore who are Asians, um, they really uh, seems to have a war when it comes to sex. So yeah, it's not just um, something that uh, is, is people can't really see, it, but they can sense it. Um, basically the prudishness of uh, Singaporeans uh, so yeah, I, I deal with this, um, and even though I I, I run a one-person practice, so people who come and see me, they are self-selecting, and they come to me because there are problems. Like, they don't come to me because uh, they uh, want to have better sex, generally. It took me a long while, I don't know why, maybe call me slow, it took me a long while to realize why my workshops weren't doing so well because the people who want to improve their sex lives are very different from my clients who just want to be able to have sex. So the people who would want to learn about sex would have to already be kind of sex positive or sex curious, but actually a lot of my clients just want to be functional. And so this was why the, the clients don't necessarily translate into people who come for my workshops. And the two groups don't seem to match. 
And that was why I was having difficulties trying to fill seats uh, in workshops. So for seven years now, I've been running like workshops. I persisted in running workshops. Um, and um, they have always been really small workshops. Mm -hmm. We find the same thing over here. Usually our, our workshops, when we do them, are under 12 people, if we can get that many. But yes. the people who come to the workshops, they're either the type just beginning and have questions, or they are, again, someone who's sex positive and versed and just wanting to learn more. I could understand in such a society where, where sex is so frowned upon that if they have problems, they want to keep it private. Yeah. So that, that happens. It takes a lot for people to come for my workshop. They were very afraid of bumping into somebody they know, and uh, they are really afraid of being uh, put on the spot or being made a fool. So I'm, uh, that was one of the reasons why I started actually uh, sharing more and more about my personal life in my workshops and realizing how effective it was because it would break the ice, it would allow people to have opportunities to start asking questions. So I, I basically kind of uh, stumbled into making myself into some kind of like an entertainer, educator uh, in workshops and uh, in, in uh, private sessions, um, in coaching sessions, it's different. <laughs> In the, co in the coaching sessions, in the one-on-one, -on -one, you get to be the doctor. Out, out in front of 12 people, you have to be the entertainer. <laughs> yes, precisely. So, um, so sometimes having this uh, dual role um, in counseling, um, they call it like conflict of interest. Um, but really, like in, a, in, a, in, a, in this city, there's not that many sex educators. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm the... I'm their only bet, really. <laughs> awesome. And, and is it, do you think it's because of culture that people are still kind of in the closet about sex? Yeah, I think it's very much our Asian culture. And actually, it's like really strange to me. Like, what does Asian culture mean? Asian culture, Asians, Asian values. I see us as a melting pot of everything that we experience, including uh, Western influences. So there was, uh, while I was growing up, there was this identity crisis that I had because my whole life I was told, you must respect your elders. And I didn't know, like, why, why should I respect my elders? <laughs> and and uh, so it was very strange um, things that I was expected to understand as an Asian and um, uh, how I was supposed to behave. And imagine being somebody who was told your whole life to just... Um, shut up and look pretty. So it was hard for me to find my own voice and to really uh, um, be, be, uh, be willing to be different. Um, there's a lot of conformity here. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of uh, clients who are good girl, good boys, who were told don't masturbate, don't have premarital sex, wait till you get married. Uh, and and um, they are the ones who have problems with sex. They are very disconnected from their bodies. I have a lot of clients with vaginismus. Um, so vaginismus is a condition that happens when a woman's vagina uh, shuts down, making penetration difficult or impossible. And in my experience, working with people with primary vaginismus who have never had penetrative sex, uh, most of them um, just... Um, shut down their sexuality and uh, decide to wait until after marriage. <gasps> and when, when I ask them, they they say uh, it's not just religious reasons. A lot of them are actually not religious. Uh, it's more cultural. They have this fear of being used for sex. Um, they don't trust their own discretion and discernment. And uh, sex is for procreation. And so, yeah, I work with a lot of vaginismus clients, like a lot. In the last seven years, I would say at least 400 couples. And every week, I have a few inquiries on vaginismus. Uh, so really, uh, in a nutshell, vaginismus is basically a, a, a phobia, a phobia of pain. So there's no pain 
uh, it, there may be pain. Uh, however, in in some in most cases, actually, it's the fear of pain before the pain actually happens, and then the fear of pain actually causes the pain, and then the pain actually makes them think and continue their belief that sex is painful, and so uh, it's impossible to have sex. So I work with a lot of these kinds of clients, people who are sexually ignorant, sexually repressed, sexually inhibited. And um, uh, yeah, so that's what I do a lot. No wonder you need all that training. My God, that's like, holy cow. I'm not, I know a person here in Florida who had that vaginal mess, but that's one person out of thousands that I know. And you're going through 400 couple. I was like, wow, that that's a lot. Yes. So- it, it so is. So I'm. I'm. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, John. I know. I was just saying. So. So it is a psychological fear of pain yes. that actually relates down to them having pain during sex when it's not yes. a physical cause. Yes. Wow. So, so it's 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 a uh, it's a phobia of of uh, pain. You know, in a very simple uh, uh, explanation. Um, I know people who have uh, secondary vaginismus, but what I'm dealing with um, really is primary vaginismus, people who have not had any previous experience. So when I um, talk to even psychologists um, who don't have sex training in Singapore, you know, or like somebody who says that they do like sex therapy sometimes um, because of their lack of training, Sometimes they would just say, oh, yeah, they must have had some trauma. They must have been molested. They must have had some kind of, like, assault or, like, some uncle or something. I was like, no, you don't understand. Um, Just like people have a fear of spiders, cockroaches, flying, swimming, drowning. Like, don't assume everybody who has a fear of something uh, must have had a bad experience. And uh, it's it's very unfortunate that even even uh, people who help people who are supposed to be trained uh, don't who don't have the specialized training are actually not equipped to help them. And uh, so I am I'm able to explain to them um, as a woman who uh, has lost her virginity what the deflowering process can be like that can feel good. Because my own um, deflowering process was really um, empowering and beautiful. And so when I weave in my personal experiences and stories and techniques, um, so these are things that haven't been, I haven't found anywhere in the world. And so I weave that into my practice and I use uh, analogies to explain to my clients um, and to explain to them how uh, and what to anticipate. So... In one session, I can dispel some of their misconceptions very quickly and then uh, give them some suggestions of what ca- they could do. So, yeah, so, so, so yes, it's, uh, it's, it's psychological. Uh, I don't know why um, um, people, like, make it, like, so complicated. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah, it's really unfortunate, really. Uh, if, even if you look online about, like, first-time sex, um, there's really not a lot of good information. A lot of it is um, pretty cliche. Like you must have romance, you must have candles, music, mood. You must have lots of foreplay. You must have lots of loop. Like these but, are not really, you know, these are not really the best techniques to help someone because pain is pain. Um, how do you ease someone uh, first time sex? Um, feeling really strange, something entering the vagina for the first time. And then, um, you know, it's not like in porn, I I use this analogy, where the penis is not, doesn't glide in like an eel. (laughs) (laughs) No, it doesn't. Not the first time. Oh my God. Yeah. So, so people set themselves up for failure because they, they think that it's going to glide in like an eel. And then they're like, oh, I, I didn't know it would be, painful i didn't know it would be uh, uh uh like tearing pain i was like i didn't know that i would like feel all these sensations and i'm like you know there's something going into your body 
Um, so you think it's normal to not feel anything? So so they don't really like. Um, they, I I feel it's a little bit like the the kampong spirit the like the elder woman sharing with the younger woman like okay this is what it's going to be like you know i feel that that is really missing uh in our culture and so because of this whole culture of sexual repression um so clients who have never talked to anybody about sex um actually articulating and using uh expression and words for sex for the first time in front of me. Oh, so wow. So that be, uh, is, is sometimes really sad. Yeah, whether it's a man or a woman, there are men or women who say things like, you know, I've, I realize I've actually never talked about sex. Uh, and it's, it's not just to me, uh, it's even like to their spouse. They don't even talk about it. They have sex, but they don't talk about it. You know, for a world where so much of the media and Hollywood is all about sex, it's all the, the glamour and, and the, the fakeness. And when it comes to educating, it's it's so hard to even get it out there. Um, and, and what you're doing, you're right. There is almost, at least when my first time I had sex, the girl I had sex with was a virgin. And I, again, for a guy, I'm freaked out. I'm having sex, so I'm happy. But she was traumatized. And there's almost nothing out there to tell you it does get better. Yeah, and sometimes it doesn't get better for them because the first time is pain. So their association of sex is pain. And sex is then always painful because their lover or their partner doesn't know how to make sex easier for them. So in in my work, you know, there's a... There's, um, I have had the training to be a, a sexological body worker, so I've had the training, but uh, I don't do touch on nudity in my work. So very much just coaching, uh, using my mouth, not physically, verbally. <laughs> right. And uh, with sexological body workers, they actually believe that um, when you've had uh, pain during sex, uh, it's a form of trauma that happens inside the vagina, and uh, this can cause tension and uh, blockages and uh, numbing and desensitization that can happen. What happens is the vagina is a muscle that is full of nerve endings. So the more that is massage and the more awareness and being in your body there is, the more you will actually be able to feel sensation and the more likely you will be able to have vaginal orgasms and so for a while I was very puzzled why I was having clients who um, talked about sex in a in a very like you know like whatever kind of tone and when I asked them about how does it feel when you are being penetrated like how does it really feel and then that was when I realized that a lot of them were having numbing in their vagina and a lot of them were not enjoying sex because um, their association of sex was pain. Uh, their vagina was kind of like not feeling what they were supposed to feel because it was probably uh, what we call like blocked, like blockages inside. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's really sad. It's really sad um, that um, because they have they have lovers or partners who just didn't know better that uh, this perpetuates and this can really um, affect their sex life for the rest of their life because um, you know if you remember like um, Jack Morin the erotic uh, the erotic mind he talks about the core erotic theme and he says that we have what we call peak experiences so the first time we do something we always remember it mm. so their first time sex is traumatic, that is going to affect the rest of their lives' um, association with sex. I had such a tremendous, wonderful, empowering first time sex experience. It was one of the sweetest times of my entire life. And because I remember that, I assumed, I thought that, uh, you know, women would have partners who were like that, but actually my partner was the exception. And, Extremely. And so, <laughs> 
Yes, and and so what happened was because I had such a positive um, deflowering virginity experience, I, I I have a really positive attitude about sex, and that was one of the reasons why I later went on to be a sexologist and be a sex educator because I really love sex. I really want to help people uh, who have problems with sex. And I had I was surrounded by friends who were what we consider frigid, who have low sex drive, who didn't like sex, who avoided sex, who who um, you know didn't understand what I was talking about when I say sex is wonderful. And so I was really sad, and that was one of the reasons why I became, I went and got all this training. And you became their superhero. Wow. I just find this fascinating because it's just a whole different culture and world just learning about this. I mean, because I I know from our little deep pockets here in the South how some people can be anti-sex, not feeling, you know, any attraction or anything. And I just, just hearing that part and it just like blows me away. And then just thinking, it's like, What about if they're into kink or even alternative lifestyles? How do they feel? Uh, Yeah, so like uh, for for a very long time, I I, I mean, because I wasn't exposed to people of different kinds of sexuality, really, as a heterosexual uh, woman. And when I I went to sex school, I was, uh, all my classmates were, uh, didn't really just identify with heterosexuality, like, most of my classmates were gay, lesbian, bisexual. I had one transgender uh, classmate, and then uh, most of them were open uh, in open relationships or polyamorous or you know uh, kinky in some way. And then started to uh, go to dungeons, you know, to figure out like different kinds of sexuality. So when I came back to uh, Singapore, I I really didn't know for a while like how to connect with the BDSM community. And um, it was only recently, really, that I went to a play party in Singapore, and I was looking around, and I was like, whoa, this is this is just like the U.S., except they're all Asians. So I was, <laughs> you know, like, I was having this real mindfuck, because like after seven years, like, you know, I'm not used to seeing Asians, like, being so open, and here they were like running around in that um, play party and um, having lots of fun. And because I'm not really like into kink, like I am kink friendly, sure, I'm an educator, I'm aware of it, I'm aware why people like it and the eroticism behind it. But I personally am not really like so into it, like maybe a little bit, but not like like a lifestyle, not like, you know. It's like a preference as opposed to an orientation, mm-hmm. and so yeah, it was it was it was interesting to see that um, that um, they do exist. You just need to know like the right people, and so I do uh, I do support my clients who are interested to connect with the community here. Well, it's good to know the lifestyle does exist. We've talked with people uh, in other countries in in Europe. And every country has their own uh, story with the lifestyle of how it's either very out in the open or it's underground or everyone knows about it. And, you know, in the Asian culture, it, it's very hush-hush it, it is the, the illusion I was given. Um, but it's wonderful that yeah. you were able to at least touch with it and it does exist. There yeah. is an option. Yes, it is hush-hush because people want to protect their identity because even though Singapore has 5.5 million people now um, for uh, for this amount of people it's actually a really small physical space like if you are in certain circles like you would pretty much like know a lot of the same people and what happens is like if you were in certain communities like BDSM or in a like swingers kind of lifestyle, like in Malaysia or in Indonesia, like you could get into real serious trouble. So, you know, if you are a homosexual, even in Pakistan, like people are still being killed for it. So, you know, it's not so far from, from us. And so it is really important for people to um, feel safe. And so, 
yeah, you need to know the right people to get connected. And um, um, once you're in, you're in. But yeah, you do need to prove yourself by attending their events and uh, understanding their code of conduct and things like that. Wow, sounds like the uh, BDSM communities here in, in Florida that you have to be vetted before someone lets you into the door to just talk to another person. And they do exist in Florida. We know of a few. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. um, sorry, just jumping back, there was last month in the news, uh, I believe it was Malaysia, that a gay couple um, was caned publicly. Yeah. Uh, for... uh, Indonesia, yeah, that was horrific. It's a it's a part of Indonesia that is actually trying to have independence, and so it's it's really horrific. It's really horrific that um, um, people are being persecuted in this way. Even in Singapore, you know, homosexuality is illegal, and. Even though the government has said we are not going to actively persecute them, then why? Why do you have it in your law then? And um, we have this annual little like squat really in a park and where people come together, they wear pink, they form a little dot and it's actually happening this weekend. So that's our one and only like, well, not the only, but like... Um, the one big um, one? Yeah, like pink dot, you know, and um, form a little, little pink dot and, and call it like uh, we we stand for love. We're celebrating love and families and the right for everybody to love. And even then, the government has stepped in in the last two years as pink dot became, became more of a movement and say things like, oh, you know, foreigners shouldn't be participate foreign sponsors shouldn't give money to them. Um, so now local companies are coming forward and giving money. About 100 companies have come forth to give money. And then um, these foreign uh, sponsors have petitioned to the government and said, well, you said we need to apply to participate. So now we're applying. And then the government's like, well, don't get involved with our politics. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so the persecution is not so obvious, but it's kind of like a highbrow kind of persecution that is still happening. So it's good that this is happening because then Singaporeans can see for themselves that it is true that homosexuals are being discriminated and being uh, persecuted, even though it's not public caning, but they don't necessarily feel accepted or safe. I think that's a struggle everywhere, even parts of the United States. Uh, there's definitely discrimination against the LGBTQ community. And in other places in the United States, it, it, it's very welcomed. It just depends on, on where you go. Well, it's getting to the point that a lot of the local governments here in Orlando um, and communities and companies that made a difference with our pulse shooting is going out to various parts of the United States and educating people on how to handle um, the LGBT community, how to assist them either with mental health and services. And it, it's, a, it's a movement now, so which is fantastic yeah. to see. And, and I'm, I'm slow to the game, but I realized that um, – certain uh, multinational companies are really big on the topic of diversity and inclusion. And because of their policy of recognizing that when you have more diversity, uh, your company is actually stronger in representing your customers. So this uh, commercial perspective of looking at diversity and inclusion, inclusion of people of all races, nationalities, uh, ages, uh, abilities, uh, orientations, for instance, like this commercial uh, slant to it uh, is actually really important for sex educators to get in on that because then we can go in to companies and actually be able to uh, be a positive voice for change. So I'm, I'm really interested about that because I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, because if... Uh, you know, we are not able to reach out to adults once they leave the education system. Then how do we 
begin to advocate and how do we educate people um, when they are kind of like uh, fixing their ways or if they're not exposed like I was as a heterosexual uh, Chinese uh, woman born and bred in Singapore like you just don't know what you don't know and you're not exposed and it's not that people don't care it's just that they just really didn't know better and so now that I, have, I know better there's no way that I can just keep quiet and not do anything when there are people who are suffering yeah, absolutely. Is that why you created your two books, The Love, Sex, Everything in Between and Orgasmic Yoga? Um, well, actually, my my first book is a compilation of different essays that I wrote over the years. Uh, I think this was like maybe into the third or fourth year of my practice. And then my second book... Orgasmic Yoga was published maybe two years ago when I uh, realized how powerful uh, mindful ma um, masturbation is and how it has changed my life. So the two books are quite extreme really <laughs> to each other. One is a very like prim and proper like educational book, which is to me kind of like, you know, the book that you just do because everybody says you must have a book. <laughs> <laughs> and, then the, and then the second book is the book that went like so different, like talking about the link between sex and spirit and mindfulness and uh, different ways of connecting with your body, breath, sound, movement, touch, intention, uh, pelvic floor squeezes. And so the other book was the book that was people would go, whoa, like this woman's crazy. <laughs> um, uh, at least, at least here in the Asian culture, like what? I guess what yoga was that? Uh, is it some kind of yoga? And um, so the second book was really the book that I should do. So now I'm uh, I'm supposed to, um, but I haven't um, worked on my third book. And my third book is going to be more of like a memoir on I survived the seventh year each. So my practice have has you know, um, just past its seventh year. And I, 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 wa I wanted a book to talk about my own personal journey, um, the, the trials and tribulations, the ups and downs, finding myself as a woman, as an educator. So a bit of personal and professional into it. Um, and yes, I, uh, I should, I, and I must put in things that, um, has changed in me and why I speak up um, for people uh, who are different, the GLBTQ. And um, it's important, it's important, you know, I mean, I don't just talk about the GLBTQ, like, I also care about animals, I also care about people who are disabled. I I'm vegetarian, and so I really care about the underdogs. Yeah, totally. You, the way you've been explaining everything, you, you are the underdog superhero there because it, it's just intriguing considering it's 2017 and still have kind of like a mindset of like turn of the century, 1800s, 1700s kind of shh, don't talk about it, you know, sex and things. I was like, wow. We haven't been to Singapore, but we have some friends who have been over there on business, and we were told um, it, it's a city-state, correct? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I, w I was told it is very westernized, and it is kind of like the more liberal part of, uh, of Asia. Mm -hmm. um, and then to hear in some other ways how you guys are fighting the battles we're fighting from 40, 50 years ago. Um, we recently saw a play um, – it was put on about a, a gay man's lifestyle, and he was talking about living in Florida and being gay in 1985 and how it was dangerous back then to come out as gay. It was actually there were there, there were people there who would victimize you, and to see that still going on, even in Singapore, is, is such a shame. But I do want to go ahead and say we've been talking about having a yoga for sex class for months now. 
<laughs> because Angelique does do yoga, and she does she 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 does say when when she's going regularly, the sex is better, M- mind and body, it all comes together when she's doing yoga. So we may have to get your book now. <laughs> yeah, my book um, doesn't really. I mean, it, it has the word yoga inside, but it actually is not really yoga. Uh, yoga uh, was loosely used as the term that means practice. So orgasmic practice, which means ah. you, ah. masturbate, you masturbate for a prolonged period of time, 30 minutes. And when, uh, just like anything, you do it for some time and then you get, you get into a really deep trance state. And so uh, when you get into that deep state, uh, it's like meditation. So this is the link between ma- masturbation and meditation. So uh, I, I know what you're talking about. I think you, you you guys can do it. You guys can do like couples yoga. That would be really cool. Um, I would love to run such a class. Um, I find uh, traditional yoga actually kind of boring. I do laughter yoga. I do orgasmic yoga. Um because I'm actually hyper flexible, so I actually find yoga pretty boring. No wonder. It's like I'm still struggling here. <laughs> yeah. So, so I think it would be really great for you guys to uh, run your yoga class, and you can call it like, you know, like coin some term for it, and uh, it would be cool. Well, I'm still going to read your book. I, I'm very, I'm more, I'm more interested now in what you said as far as being able to to, to zone out into a 30 minute masturbation. That sounds wonderful. Yeah, it is. It's changed my life. It's 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 not I, like I'm not that you know uh, great. And I I came out with this thing. Uh, it's really coined by Joseph Kramer, and it's not like my my copyright thing. Uh, lots of people are talking about orgasmic yoga around the world, and um, but I'm the one who decided to write a book about it because I love it so much. It changed my life. It's, it taught me how to really learn how to love myself and heal my heart in a really deep way, so much so that um, uh, inside of the bedroom and then outside of the bedroom, realizing how to have a lot of gentleness and... and uh, and compassion for myself, which uh, really uh, I needed to get it into my body to really understand it. Like we we hear all these things all the time, but to really really embody it, like that really changed my my life. Well, and you've seen that also with your clients who've read your book, or do you do workshops yes. with orgasmic yoga book? Yes, I, I do teach uh, orgasmic yoga, so I do like talks on it. And then uh, when I was in Australia, we did like a 30 minute like practice around it. And um, uh, people in, in Singapore are um, saying, uh, you're, you're, you know, I don't want to attend a talk where you're just talking. Like, can we just do something experiential? I said, well, you know, we are in Singapore. I'm not going to um, do uh, nudity workshops. Um, I still am very mindful of towing the line because um, after seven years, yes, I, I care a lot less what people think of me. Uh, however, I really care. What I really care about are my clients who are suffering, who need me. And so if I'm too radical, I'm, I'm turning away people who think that I'm a freako. Gotcha. Uh, and, and so... Uh, so that's why I made the stand uh, when I first started my practice seven years ago. I would never do um, touch or nudity workshops. I mean, I have some touch workshops, but never any nudity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, do you give them like flashcards or homework? It's like, okay, this is what you need to do or? Yeah, yeah I give them homework um, and then I explain as best as I can. And some people don't care about these things, about explaining. They just say, like, you know, like, why can't you just show us? And say, well, you know, this is how I work. I'm sorry, but, you know, I'm not going to be all things to everybody. 
and these are my boundaries. No, of course not. Um, we actually had gone what, last year to a convention, and uh, I've been to a workshop, and it was in um, Alabama. I'm, I'm sorry, Georgia. It was, it was Georgia, Atlanta. Which is a very uh, fairly conservative state, but the presenter was from California, which is very, again, very liberal. And at the end of the workshop, she's like, I'm done 15 minutes early. Normally, I would do a physical presentation, but it's illegal here. So mm. it really does depend on, again, you you, you got to work inside the laws uh, of where you are because you don't want to get in that much. You want to push the lines, but you don't want to break them and end up in trouble. Yes, what happens is like if I'm in somewhere like California or like Australia and people are a lot more open, like the culture is open. But here when I do it, it's going to be like I'm doing it for the wrong reasons, mm -hmm. you know. People are, are coming because they want to see a freak show. They're, ah. not really, they are not really ready to learn, you see. They can't, gotcha. you can't even talk about sex. How are you going to be able to do those explicit workshops? So I don't, I don't want, even though that would be the easy way to get lots of media attention and make lots of money, that's not, that's not, what I, that's not why I want to do it. I want to help people, right. not harm them. Not make things worse for them, not be a circus uh, animal. Um, so that's that's where I make the separation. I, I'm sure that there will be people um, before or even after me who um, do things like that. Um, but um, for me, I I was very clear in my head that I would never do that. And great choice there, yeah, because those people that didn't get any information or is traumatized over like the first pain needs it more than the freaks that could go on the internet and get that crazy stuff on yeah i'm i'm very uh, mindful you know so like for instance when i um um uh, in january i was at the really good sex festival in sydney australia so i was there presenting for the second time in the year before also and uh, both times i was very mindful uh, even though uh, people were like, you know, hooking up and getting on with other people and like doing stuff, um, I have to be very careful that I was there uh, in my professional name. I was there as a presenter attending another workshop, even though as a workshop participant, I would participate in whatever way I could, uh, but I really wasn't going to be doing those hooking up because I don't want any single rumor or like negative talk of me to ripple and spill out into Singapore. And then people are going to say, you know, like this person is whatever, loose, what, what, what. Because people here are, are quite judgmental also and ignorant and repressed and, you know. They're just looking for that one gossip thing to bring you down. <laughs> yeah. So I've always wanted uh, to be uh, whiter than snow. And uh, to have a practice where nobody could ever find any fault with, with me, with the way I do things, and to always have the safety of my clients in mind. Yeah, so anyway. Well, there's nothing wrong with putting your career first. And in going through your, the, your website, I'm seeing you've written for, what, Men's Health, uh, Shape Singapore, uh, Cosmopolitan, and you have your own uh, radio show as well, too. Yes, and you guys are coming on next week. Oh, yes. so it is next week, the 5th. Okay, because I had it down the 13th. Okay, I'll change up the calendar. <laughs> oh, yeah. Is it next week? Oh. We'll figure okay, it out. <laughs> so, okay, I'll let you know. So tell us about your show a little bit. Um, I'm assuming you have – it is broadcast in Singapore, and I'm assuming you have different restrictions than what we have over here yes. as well. Okay, so it's different, right? Because the radio show is online. Um, it's uh, hosted on Om Times Radio Network. So Om Times Radio, uh, uh, basically, is a spin-off from the magazine Om Times, okay. which is a holistic ma magazine that's been running for about 10 years. So I was very interested uh, as a sexologist, you know, with all this academic stuff about sex. And then at some point, I was very interested in the link between sex and spirit, and so Om Times was the perfect platform to explore the link between the two. So far, I've had a lot of tantricers and a lot of people in the BDSM community. I've had sex workers. 
uh, come on the show and talk about how they think uh, uh, sex uh, and spirit are linked and also talked about like uh, any anything else relating to sex. So yeah, I'm very happy to have uh, both of you on the show. And we're looking forward to it. Yeah, because that's one of the things I always teach in my little practice and my workshops that it um, sex is connected to mind, body, and spirit. If one's not yes. connected, everything else is all messed up. So we have yes. to work on that in order to have fun and enjoy. Now, do you also teach parents to how to talk to their kids or is that taboo? Um, well, I would love to uh, run such uh, workshops for parents with kids. However, I don't really have that kind of outreach. Okay. Um, to access to parents. Um, I feel that there are already organizations in Singapore doing that. I don't know how good a job they're doing, but um, there are organizations doing it. Uh, you know, we have focus on the family here in Singapore. They, they, you know, like they have a, a thousand volunteers. I can't compete with that skill and magnitude <laughs> of resources that they have. No, they need a thousand of you out there to tell you the truth. Just after hearing everything that's going on, I was like, oh, my God. It's like if you could see our jaws just on the floor when you were just explaining everything, we're like, oh, my God. It sounds like a third world country to a certain extent, but it's not. That's what makes it yeah. fascinating. Yes. So nobody knows what happens behind the doors. And I'm telling you, there's lots of unhappy people. <laughs> Lots of unhappy people who are not having sex. Good That's sex so at sad. that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's so sad. <laughs> and, and they're so serious about it as well, you know. It's, it's, uh, they're so scared to do anything. They're so, you know, I get asked a lot. I'm sure uh, you get asked a lot of these questions too. On like, what is normal? What is normal? Is this normal? Is this okay? Is this going to make me an uh, addict? Uh, so there's a lot of like... Uh, the, the questions ar around that because of the lack of uh, information and education, which uh, leads to a lot of inhibitions of what is right and wrong, what my partner think if I suggest this. And there's really not a lot of play. There's not a lot of creativity and fun, you know. <laughs> and so, so, so behind closed doors, uh, I, I don't think a lot of people are having... Um, much sex and if they have sex I really don't think mm, you know how much of it is good sex especially after baby oh yeah no I, I could just imagine after baby you don't want to be go near the woman or the woman wants to be touched because of all the pain and labor and it's just like but still well it's, it's hard and now I'm not I'm a man obviously but from what I know and heard it is it's obviously hard after giving birth uh, to one or multiple children getting back into the sexual groove of things. Um, most couples have that issue. But you're right, there is, again, no support or resources yes. to push people into that. It's like, you've done your job with sex, now be happy and raise your child. Yeah. And then the focus uh, is so much on the child. And also, you know, with I don't know what, you know, it's like on the household distribution. But here it's like, it's very much on the woman. And so she's, she's, she has this job, most women have jobs, and uh, then they're tired from work, and then they have to do the housework, and then take care of the kid, and make sure they do their homework. And so she's exhausted. So I, I know not, not all households are like that, I know not all men are like that, but it does come across that way with a lot of my clients, where um, they're just completely exhausted all the time. Yeah, I could just imagine, and not only just physically, but just mentally and emotionally just for doing everything. I mean, yeah, that is kind of so sad. <laughs> it's... I know. I, I feel very fortunate that I have my own practice and I don't have to live my life the way my clients live their lives. Because really, um, from the way they describe, I would say all of them, every single one of them are working like eight 10, 12 hours a day. And uh, most of them are not having sex on weekdays. And 
you know, then they feel pressurized that they must have sex on the weekend on top of the household chores and then like they have to visit their parents or in-laws and uh, socialize with their friends and, you know, uh, exercise. <laughs> so there's really like uh, not a lot of time for them to have any kind of a life. It's not just time. It's also there's a guilt around self-care, which is very yeah. much here in the United States. And I know it's in Europe and I'm hearing it's over there as well, that if you take time out to take care of yourself, you're being selfish. And yes. the martyr concept has come and gone. No one, no one needs a martyr. You're not useful no more. Yeah. So I don't think it's just like Asian couples. I think my Caucasian couples are also the same. Once they have a kid, they feel like there's work and then there's home. There's no self-care uh, left for themselves. So when self-care, they talk about like exercise, but there's really no time uh, and they feel so guilty. Uh, there's no time for them to socialize or have fun with their friends anymore. And uh, then at some point, they start they start wondering like why they are not happy, why they feel that they have lost a big part of themselves. And they realize that um, they actually left out that part because there's just not enough time in the day to have everything met. So it's so important to bring that up to clients. And I see this again and again that they, they start losing pieces of themselves and they don't realize um, when they're so far gone that they're actually depressed, you know, they're not happy and then they, they don't even know why. <laughs> so they look around and they say, yeah, but you know, um, you know, they, they try to compare with other people who are just coping and say, well, you don't, you don't just want to cope, you want to be happy. Right. Grass is never greener on the other side. You don't know the dark closet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's been a pleasure, Martha. Thank you for all the fascinating information, everything that you do. How can our audience members find you? Yes, so they can go to my website. That's eroscoaching.com. And uh, all the links to social media is there. I have a, a very active YouTube channel. So I, I post uh, one video every day. Uh, let's see how long that lasts. <laughs> but yeah, I've been doing that for the last two months or so. Yeah, I was about to ask you on that. It's like, where's your self-care there doing that? I love your videos. I've had shared them completely. That's how we got connected. But still, where's your self-care? Yes. <laughs> Yes, so uh, a lot of people don't know this, but um, they don't believe me, but it's true. Uh, I'm an introvert, so I actually spent a lot of time by myself. That would make sense with the YouTube video then. <laughs> yes, so while I, while I try to um, help as many people as I can, um, but actually I do need a lot of privacy. I, I feel very... Uh, overwhelmed when people messaging me on Facebook that I don't know and um, you know so yeah I, I, I don't I don't go for networking events I find it really like exhausting it, it's it's funny because um, I've come out of my shell uh, but for years I was an introvert and if you told me 10 years ago that I would be teaching at a college, meaning I get up in front of a dozen more students every, you know, every day and lecture and then have a radio show, I would have said bullshit on that. But it it's, <laughs> seems like you know, eventually we all get pulled out, and uh, I'm glad you came out. <laughs> well, it doesn't help that you married an extroverted uh, Mexican here who's very vivacious and social. So <laughs> We're a good balance. I'm quiet, she's loud, and somewhere in, in the middle there's, there, there's a, a good volume. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, it's important to, to monitor your energy because we can't be all by ourselves all the time. Um, there is this pool, yes, there's this pool. And the pool for me uh, is to help, help people, help as many people as I can. I mean, I'm thankful now. Um, you know, for a long time I was not happy why I'm born uh, Chinese. Uh, and female, um, but now I see there's a purpose for it, you know. Asians identify with me, they feel safe with me, and I can get through to them, cut through the bullshit, and really help them in a way that nobody else can. I can speak their language, I look like them, they feel safe. So I, I really use everything of myself to help people. 
And that's great. And they are so blessed and lucky to have you. Don't and stop. Don't. They really don't. Thank you very much for being on the show. You Thank can... you for having me. Oh, absolutely. Anytime there. Uh, you can find me on Miss Angelique Luna everywhere on social media. The podcast on Living a Sex Positive Life, the website, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And you can find me on Facebook and Twitter as John C. Luna. And reach out and say hi and tell us what you think. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.